fellow truth seekers, wherever you may be on this wonderful planet. This is Touchstone Tom, bringing you a new edition of Grok the Talk, from the enchanting countryside of Tochigi, Japan. And I tell you, you are in for an incredibly informative show, as I talk with one of the great thinkers of the day, the pioneering author, Alexander Putney. Alex's scientific approach to the study of our ancient past is not fettered by conventional dogmatic ways of thinking, and indeed sheds a new light on where we have come from and lights the way to where we may be headed. In this episode, we focus mainly on his outstanding book, Phi, and on his exploration of psychoacoustic instruments in particular. Please join along with us by accessing his website at humanresonance.org. So sit back, get centered, because here we go. Another edition of Grok the Talk. Today our guest is Alex Putney, who will be joining us from California. And he is the author of uh, six books. His most recent book, Lightwater, has just been released, which I'm very excited about. Um, he has a wonderful web page, which is humanresonance.org. And if you're near a computer, go ahead and uh, connect up to that and join us as we, uh, as we talk about his book, Phi, today. I want to first uh, mention how I came across Alex, and that was through a recent Red Ice interview. Uh, it was about uh, four or five months ago. That interview has gone on to be the most repeatedly played MP3 on my iPod. I was very struck by um, the tone of Alex's voice and his lucidity in his presentation. And in the second hour, I was absolutely thrilled when he started talking about going barefoot because that is something I've been doing for uh, that I had been doing for about four months before I had come across uh, Alex and I know how beneficial this is so hopefully we'll talk about that as well today I think we're in line for a fantastic show so with that I'd like to bring Alex on the line Alex welcome and how are things in California Thanks, Thomas. Things are beautiful here. We've had a few days of sunshine. We've been enjoying being outdoors before the rain comes. But hopefully we'll get a good balance of that, too, because it's been pretty dry. Absolutely. Um, I understand that you have been down in La Mana for quite an extended period of time in the past uh, few months. Could you tell us about what kind of research and what activities you're doing down there? Yeah, I've been uh, working in La Mena, Ecuador, for about uh, six, seven years now, when I originally was introduced to the site through a project I was working on with Klaus Dona in Europe, uh, touring with his museum, uh, Mystery Park, it was the first destination for his Unsolved Mysteries exhibition. So that was a pretty fascinating uh, first encounter with a group of over 300 artifacts from that location in Ecuador, which is pretty much on the western side of the Andes in central Ecuador in the foothills. So that was a, a pretty intense journey, which I first took in uh, several years ago, and then for the first time in two years now returned uh, for the last few months and was investigating properties there and looking at and testing the waters and uh, enjoying the fog and the amazing energy there, which I believe is connected with a, connected with a special acoustic resonance that's felt in that area. Yes. Now, had you uh, heard about Lamana before you came across Klaus Dona? I know he was on uh, Project Camelot uh, uh, about a year ago talking about his artifacts. It's very, very interesting stuff. So your introduction to Lamana yeah. came through him, is that correct? It did, yeah. And actually, I, I uh, was lucky enough to connect with the owner of the artifacts as well as the discoverer of the artifacts who had given them as a gift to the present owner, whose name is Herman Villamar. 
and the discoverer's name is um, Dr. or Ingeniero Sotomayor um, is what he's called down there. He's pretty well known in that area, but um, he was a pretty amazing person in his own right before passing them on to the present owner. And so the history of these artifacts really goes back into the 80s when they were discovered. And um, the amazing connection with the ener energized water that is discovered at the site, too, is really uh, something that's um, well known in the town and a kind of mythology in the area because it's well known for their purified waters in so many parts of that area in the mountains and the foothills there. So it's a really beautiful place where I think a lot of, um, you know, underground resources exist that are go beyond the gold that's known from that area. I see. Now, you say there's a connection between the artifacts and the water. What, what do you mean by that? Well, the area was originally prospected by gold, um, gold, you know, prospectors interested in pursuing that angle. And so they were mining and finding in tunnels these artifacts and niches that kept popping up. And so there was um, one particular one that had a large cache of over 300 artifacts, including metal, stone, and ceramic um, examples of ancient Sanskrit culture. And these artifacts blow people's minds because and many people um, you know, believe they're fraudulent because they present things like cobras, which are not found in Ecuador, obviously. Yeah. And also symbolism connected with Kundalini tradition that we know from India connected with the cobra, like chakra wheels or the concept of, you know, the chakra itself being um, an energy vortex in the body and using energy water to engage the energy fields of the body. So I think the water there is directly connected specifically with cups. There are a set of 13 stone cups which seem to be lathe turn jade. Hmm. And they're really impressive um, pieces that 12 of the 13 are smaller and there's one larger. And the 12 have a, the numerals of an ancient culture uh, that must have been connected, obviously, with the Kundalini traditions that we know from India and yet predates those traditions by uh, several thousand years and predates the Upanishads and the Vedas of India, some of the oldest books of humanity, by several thousand years as well, and yet are found in Ecuador. Wow. So those have been dated using what kind of a, a technology? Well, actually, there has not been a lot of money spent on the dating of them. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the um, amazing uh, ceramic pieces could be easily dated by thermoluminescence. So there's a lot of material to go through to pull dates from. It's just that there hasn't been any, not only that, there's been very poor conservation of the artifacts as well, and they were even painted, repainted by um, people who are trying to exhibit them without fully understanding what they meant, their great antiquity, and the importance of preserving them in the state that they were found and the conservation of that state. So it's kind of uh, upsetting because, you know, obviously these are some of the more, most important and most ancient artifacts in the world, I believe, that go into this um, scope and detail and level of technological advancement and yet our technological abilities to understand them have not been applied whatsoever. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's a real shame. Now, could, were they able to take the, uh, the paint off then of these pieces that had been uh, in a, in, inadvertently uh, co coated over? Well, it's an unfortunate story, and um, on, there are several states of, of uh, preservation or you know, uh, repainting that have been done on several of the artifacts, but there are dozens of ceramic pieces that were actually just destroyed in a recent earthquake that um, hit Ecuador when I was there probably two months ago now, wow. two and a half months. So there's not a museum, you know, that it has visitors coming to see it that's open. You know, there's one that a group has been trying to put together which has not really had any traffic, and it's obviously suffered great damage in the last earthquake. So hmm. it's, uh, it's unfortunate. I think that humanity needs to pay, not only pay attention to these artifacts, but, you know, conserve them, certainly. Absolutely. You, you go into them in great detail in the, in the latter half of, of Phi, which I hope to cover um, in uh, interviews that maybe we can do in the future. But the pictures of them are absolutely beautiful, the, the stone cups, the one big one, like you said, and then the 12 smaller ones. And that kind of brings to mind uh, the crystal skulls. I believe there's one large crystal skull 
and then uh, 12 smaller ones that were have not apparently been found yet, but in, in the oral tradition they're supposedly out there somewhere. Do, is there any significance, do you think, between those two uh, parallels there? I do, definitely. And I think um, an interesting connection exists because one of the artifacts from Lamana, Ecuador, also has a skull. It's a, it's a stone. Uh, it's not clear quartz crystal, but it's certainly crystal, uh, I think it's um, sandstone or some probably harder um, stone that has been formed into a skull. So that symbolism also exists in those artifacts, as well as cups that have scales or snakes around them, um, which I think can, can be interpreted as um, symbols for DNA, which I go into in my book as well, and which could be talked about in great detail, because I think DNA is one of the things that is most misunderstood today. Um, and we've made a lot of scientific advances there that we need to apply not only to understanding how our bodies work and how we can improve our existence in, in this world, but also how we can understand how ancient people had, the key, had found the key to that. And I think these artifacts are really the, one of the biggest clues that are hanging out there. And in the work of, of Klaus Dona, unfortunately, I don't believe that many of these uh, mysteries that I have contributed you know, significantly to understanding are addressed at all. So I think in Klaus Dona's lecture of these artifacts, he mentioned uh, that they are found with the world's finest water and didn't pursue it beyond that sentence. And so I think these deserve a lot more attention and also the effect that these waters have on the body today that can be achieved by, you know, going to Ecuador or going to other sites around the world that have the same energy. And my work is focused on, on that pursuit of that goal to give people the information to be able to use these technologies where they live. Oh, wonderful! Oh. That's something I want to talk. Uh, I want to a uh, ask you about later on in the in the interview here. Um, can you go into more detail about what you're actually doing in La Mana now? Or you mentioned that you were setting up a, a health center down there. Is that something that is progressing uh, smoothly? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of people who are hearing about the project and getting involved and. It seems like a lot of possibilities because there is a lot of water flowing from the hills in the sacred area from several different properties. So um, testing has only been done on one of those properties thoroughly, and large, large volumes of water are needed to be able to test for the gold and silver, which is the main um, amazing constituent comprised in this water that we you know, want to talk about more. But... Um, gold and silver is only one aspect of the amazing qualities that are found in it. And I think it's, uh, it's going to take a while to develop um, a, a healing center there, but that's my goal. So I'm working with several small investors, and together we're um, looking towards a long-term vision of incorporating the events of 2012 and those changes into stimulating an awareness of the possibilities for positive change that can uh, happen through being a part of those changes by being in electrical contact with the earth and actually receiving the energies that are directed to all the creatures on the planet who are receptive. And there are certain conditions which increase your receptivity and certain ones that reduce it. And we need to become aware of those things right now, I believe. Do you want to touch on those uh, now or do you want to hold those off for a later time? Um. Well, there's so many aspects to it, so I guess we can just continue and dive in. Um, I think specifically what interests me in La Mana that I'm pursuing there is not something that's exclusive to that area. And certainly the water there has amazing qualities which have been studied all around the world, although very you know, few times reported. And unfortunately in the work of Masaru Emoto, the uh, water scientist who presents crystalline images. He has not um, published his images of the water in Lamana, although he's quite aware of those, um, of those image, those, the quality of those images really that are remarkable. And um, so the underreporting of that is what really drives me to bring awareness to that site. But it's one of many that I want to work with because at this point there's a rich cultural heritage that's being overlooked and in fact denied because of the interests of big business. And I think that I'm, you know, very much beyond this, uh, you know, duality concept of, of, 
of looking at their activities and calling it evil or, you know, they may think they're Satanists, but that's a grandiose term for just people who are living in psychopathic um, ways and the patterns of business and capitalism are just simply a, a reflection of that. So when I see that paradigm, um, I look at it pretty much as, a, as, as the other side of the coin that's pushing people. You know, I'm, I'm inviting people, I believe, into living in ways that are harmonious with the future changes that I foresee coming. And I think that there are forces, negative forces as well out there that are pushing people towards that realization that there is not really that much life to be found in the technological world that's been created um, as it's been created. Technology itself is almost so, uh, it's been created really so in such a, a great contrast to the natural laws and in such direct opposition to natural consciousness that I feel that most people cannot understand uh, or, or can conceive of a resonant technology. And so that's where I feel like my work can offer a middle path to people who know that rejecting technology is key when the technology takes the form that it is. Mm -hmm. But I think the pyramids present an alternative, which is a technology that is rooted in such natural fundamental laws of the universe that there's no dichotomy created. Uh, in the way that we face, you know, every day in Western society where we're in disharmony with ourselves and our nature. Wonderful. Well, let's take up your, your invitation there and let's go into more uh, how we can access or make better use of, of these natural waters. Um, mm -hmm. I would assume the one of the main things uh, that involved in that would be uh, going barefoot because that's how you're getting your um, the electrical energies of the earth uh, directly through the soles of your feet. Definitely. And I think, you know, we cleanse our body is constantly detoxing through our feet as well. And that's because it doesn't just go one way. We don't just receive energy through our feet, which, of course, is is a major um, thing that we're talking about and identifying. Mm -hmm. And that's just electrical currents, you know, basic milliampere currents that are in the ground or in sand on the beach, especially. But um, even the effect of the expunging of toxins from your feet is actually a mechanism your body uses to communicate with plants in your environment. So barefoot living has to do not only with the, you know, the flow of energy in, but also the exit of all the toxins and, and uh, negative substances and that your body needs to expel, which are actually things that the ecosystem around you can use to, to tune into your needs. And that's information that comes through amazing teacher Anastasia uh, from Russia. And she is uh, a whole, an amazing, um, a whole, you know, comprehensive set of, of concepts that are related in a book series called The Ringing Cedars of Russia, written by Vladimir McRae. Yes, yes. But I highly recommend, highly recommend those books to anyone who's looking towards understanding more intuitively how love and the energy of love uh, collects in the earth for our use through our feet and how this lifestyle of barefoot living as well as uh, raw food diet or locavore diet eating what grows around you or what you grow yourself and especially what you grow yourself walking barefoot around um, those those fruits will have more information about your state of health and what you need to survive. And the Vedic understanding, which is given to us through the knowledge from the Siberian elders and through the pyramids themselves, which I relate in my books and their geometries, we're able to understand that the heartbeat is really the underlying um, con connective resonance that the human body um, uses to engage with the Akashic field or the energy field of the planet. Um, on a consciousness level. Very so, interesting. I've uh, come across myself in uh, literature and just in my direct experience the um, the idea or the feeling of, of getting earth energies in, but I hadn't thought about the uh, expelling of toxins through the soles of the feet. Is there any kind of um, uh, scientific literature out there that would uh, verify that or, or that we could refer to? Um, <clears throat> the science, I would have to say, there's definitely got to be research out there. I couldn't quote it to you about 
um, the cleansing that can happen through certain techniques of pulling toxins out through the feet or amplifying that effect. Mm -hmm. um, but I really couldn't tell you where to look because, you know, there's just so much research out there and I haven't really focused on it. But I would have to say that um, a lot of the things I'm speaking about are intuitively dealt with and you know some of the scientific aspects I definitely have in my books uh, presented the information that is available and probably the most important scientific um, fact or paper that I came across which informs this is one produced by um, researchers Lyman and Cali who were looking at um, the effect of electricity in interacting with HIV and they were doing blood cleansing as well and they discovered looking at cellular activity that um, in exposed cells of direct current and alternating current, mm -hmm. um, these cells were able to actually increase the functions or, or uh, transduce that electrical current into usable energy instead of the normal source being from the breakdown of ATP inside the cell adenosine triphosphate. So that source of energy would be coming from digesting foods and producing um, in, a, in a normal metabolic fashion the energies which these scientists basically have said can be supplanted by uh, electrical currents ambiently received through the cell wall. That, yes, that is an amazing concept because for probably 99.9% .9 of the population, their only source of energy is going to be through the chemical reactions, the metabolic reactions of the food they eat. But if there's another avenue available for humans to um, get their energy through a direct uh, energy source, that's, that's mm -hmm. in itself is an absolutely amazing avenue to, to pursue. Mm -hmm. And there are certainly solar gazers or yes. gurus in India or people all over the world, in fact, who uh, demonstrate the ability to go without food, and certainly their uh, so their cellular metabolism is being charged by electricity ambiently, and it's now provable. And that paper already proved it. There's no more work that needs to be done if you understand the concept as as explained, because they go into the fact that it's cellular metabolism is enhanced through enzymatic activity and all of the different cell functions, you know, purging of cells and the movement of liquid through cells is actually stimulated by electricity in a process that's been called electroporation, where all the pores of the cells pulse with the electrical current that's delivered. So literally, the uh, it's almost like cells can function, uh, it's like the ambient universe is sorry, the ambient energies from the universe that's present in all places at all times allow cells to function, which is just a finding that strikes to the core of what we, the misunderstanding really that humanity has been living in, or at least modern uh, technology has, has uh, programmed people to believe that um, there's a certain lifespan or duration of life that we have. And it's now being discovered that cellular longevity is a direct effect of the ambient energy moving through you mm -hmm. and that the life force collectively that moves through you throughout your um, existence on the planet determines how long that existence will be. And if you increase the amount of life force moving through you, i.e. electrical currents, then you can actually maintain life for, you know, unlimited durations as far as I can tell. I don't see a, a, a roof on it because... If you can go without food, <laughs> and obviously people go without water as well. Yeah. This, is, this is also possible. So the human organism is not what we thought it was. And this goes right to the heart of what I believe the Mayan elders and, and very sacred teachings around the world from most every religion relate to us, that the human organism is, a, is really spirit and is not a physical entity, really a, at, the, at the root of it, the heart of it, the essence. Absolutely. That is absolutely amazing because um, if we can uh, start to focus more on uh, making ourselves available to the earth, to the earth energies, to these electrical currents, um, and kind of get out of the mindset that we have to die when we're 70 or 80 or whatever and start pursuing these longevity modes, yeah, we could see a, a rapid increase in our longevity just from uh, some very basic 
techniques, you could even say. Um, are you familiar with the, um, I'm sure you are, but the uh, giant statues of Ramses uh, in, in yes. Egypt, and they are holding uh, what are called the wands of Horus and standing barefoot. And every statue you look at, they're, they're, and they're all over the place, that they all are standing barefoot. Um, do you think they're trying to communicate to us, saying this is kind of what we do, this is what the pharaohs do, this is what the uh, elevated man does by, through those That's statues? Definitely. And I think, you know, in every religion or sacred tradition, you have the concept that in a sacred place you take off your shoes. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, in sacred places, the key in my books that, that we have to uh, really look at, which is the invisible connection between all of these, um, of these concepts, obviously electricity is invisible most of the time, but I think sound waves is the key. And the connection between sacred places and going barefoot, I think, has to do with the fact that the stones used in the foundations of sacred sites that conduct the Earth energies are actually transducing acoustic energy in the form of infrasound standing waves that are being, uh, that are stimulating an electromagnetic field and electrical currents within the crystals of the stones of the foundations of those sacred sites. So the pyramids themselves are uh, comprised mostly of limestones, which would be mostly like 98% calcite mineral. Mm -hmm. And that's also something that we find inside the pineal gland, inside the center of the human head, which I believe is exactly what is being uh, symbolized by the third eye association with the pyramids. That third eye representing the pineal gland or the ajna chakra at the center of the human skull. Yes, and the pineal gland sits basically directly on top of the spinal cord, which is composed of 33 uh, bones, 33 vertebrae. And then you have the opening up of the, uh, the third eye, as, as you say, symbolized by, um, for example, the, uh, the snakes, the two snakes that come out of like the Tutankhamun's mask or uh, yeah. the, I'm not sure the name they use in, in India, the red dot that they put on their... Uh, forehead there is also a symbolization of uh, awakening of the third eye. Yeah, exactly, the Bhutu. And I think that culture extends and informs the Egyptian traditions, um, which I think were later. And I think the um, authorities in Egypt have a vested interest in hiding this information or suppressing it, but the stones themselves of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, as well as the other pyramids of Giza, um, the two other large pyramids at least, um, certainly preserve information in their stones for an accurate dating of different levels of construction which must have occurred at different dates. And I think that those preceding Sanskrit cultures were um, responsible for this hooded, uh, the pharaonic, of, you know, in later Egyptian times we find the pharaonic hooded um, symbolism with the stripes, the vertical stripes, and I think that directly corresponds to the Kundalini tradition and the cobra and the hooded cobra representing the kundalini energy that's being uh, assimilated by bodies that enter the pyramids. So I believe that really the difference between the use of the Egyptian pharaonic line in the pyramids versus the use of more ancient cultures and presumably the Sanskrit uh, kundalini culture that preceded it, that potentially built these structures originally, that the difference would be that in Egyptian times they were... Um, using those resources for acoustic energy for exclusively the use of the pharaohs and their families. Right, and right. yet, in previous times, they may have been used for nativ nativity practices or um, natal gestation um, ceremonies for the whole community, or in fact, for masses globally, if there was a, an initiation tradition that was going on worldwide. So I think to look for the root of the pyramid tradition, we have to go far beyond the Egyptian use and look further back in the past towards a more holistic use of these amazing structures, which were certainly more active in the human body than used as some kind of symbolism for a dead body. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, that's the term you use uh, for that is the Sanskrit culture. So you're using the word Sanskrit in, in perhaps a way that uh, differs from the way we might normally um, 
think of it. Uh, do you want to uh, talk about why you chose that term as a Sanskrit sculpture? A sculpture uh, I'm sorry, Sanskrit culture for uh, this pre-dynastic global uh, civilization. Certainly, um, in my book five, my first book, I, I deliver several translations that um, were originally done by an epigrapher who's passed away now a few years ago, um, Dr. Kurt Schildman, but his translations of several artifacts from around the world really broke open this uh, ancient Sanskrit world culture that seems to be associated with the pyramids. And his work um, really identifies a form of Sanskrit that's a precursor to all subsequent forms and forms the precursor language of descendant forms like Mayan, Sumerian cuneiform, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. And this ancient, lang this ancient uh, form that he discovered was a logographic, or what he called a uh, hieroglyphic Sanskrit. And it's comprised of symbols which are very simple geometric forms and yet have been found and, and translated by uh, Schildman on artifacts from several continents of the world. And in my book, I go into detail and, in fact, use his translation as a, his decipherment as a key to translate other texts. And it perfectly makes sense of very complex teachings that have a tone to it that exactly matches and information and content that exactly matches the ancient Sanskrit wisdom traditions, speaking about the desires in life, karma, um, and about specifically as well the resonances of the planet which is something that I, I think directly connects um, where they were doing these ancient uh, practices, where these artifacts were found around the world that Shildon has translated, and what the geometric relationship is with the pyramids globally uh, shows continuity as well as a symbolism in the artifacts themselves that really refer to a mathematical uh, formula, which I believe is encoded in the mandala of the square within the circle. That is a core teaching of all Sanskrit-related traditions, as well as we find in Tibet and around the world, as well with the Mayans. And that is what you refer to as a magnetic resonance, is that correct? That's true. That's a term that I've been using to describe the concept of the pyramids really equalizing and, and sending low frequency sound waves in a network effect globally to transduce solar energies um, into a um, enveloping um, energy storage system around the planet of Earth for our benefit. So certainly the Sanskrit culture and symbolism has for me unlocked the keys to understanding these geometric codes that I believe inform the use of the pyramids and its connection to the human heartbeat and the wavelength of the human heartbeat, which is 765 feet, and which informs the base, base length of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, which I believe is the centerpiece of the global network of resonant acoustic structures. Very interesting. So let's um, take a break here, and when we come back, let's uh, start going into the actual um, chapters of your book here. We can get into the first uh, chapter I want to focus on is psychoacoustics. So let's take a short break here, and when we come back, we'll get more into the, um, the minutia of your book. Thanks. Let's Great. do that.
as is obvious from people who have been listening so far, Alex has an incredible grasp on concepts that uh, most people are not even familiar with. Um, Alex, can you tell us what inspired you to write Phi? I mean, you are only, I believe, uh, 32, is that correct? Yeah, and I wrote that a few years ago. I mean, that to uh, me is just amazing that someone of your age can uh, put out such an incredible amount of material that is so incredibly mind-boggling. Um, how long did it take <laughs> you to compile everything for Phi? Well, compile is the right word because it was really a kind of reshuffling of my brain that happened when I realized that um, science was manipulated and what I understood of the world through that lens had huge gaping holes in it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like peering deep down into those holes because I saw like really beautiful things down in there that were not addressed or that were written off in studies like the one I mentioned earlier where they you know, concluded pretty much that human beings were not a product of food, that were a product of universal cosmic energy. And, you know, where everyone's taught, you are what you eat, you are what you eat. And I just um, decided not only did I need to unlearn a lot of untruth, but I needed to learn the truth. Um, and that took recompiling, and it took several years. And I found out that really what indigenous elders tell us that all of the this is the age of information that we are coming into awareness of the true knowledge at this time in human uh, development, and that we're for this reason re-engaging ancient knowledge that we once had and that we have in our cellular memory uh, lying in wait for us again. And I think this awakening or this memory is is what's really driving so many of the changes that we see around and and the indigenous knowledge of that is what really resonated with me and drew me to look for really primary source material, not secondary source material of um, <clears throat> misinterpretations of ancient concepts or um, misinterpretations of calendars and things like that. I, I wanted to go and find what did the Maya themselves say? What do they say today? And I found that those, that information does exist and that we can access it. And so on my website, I really don't express much opinion. I try to leave that out. I just really try to tie together fact with a plausible scenario that makes sense of what astronomy, what plasma physics, and what ancient um, Sanskrit knowledge and indigenous knowledge worldwide can provide for us that's solid. And so I look for those commonalities and try to investigate the scientific um, realities that are unfolding for us in, underneath the microscope or behind the lens of, of the uh, telescope. So bringing all those things together, I think, as humanity is gathering so much information, really the issue right now in this time is to make sense of that information. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and FIDE is an incredible uh, uh, Achievement is an incredible achievement in going in that direction. Um, you put in some not only historical and uh, cultural information in the, in the beginning of the book, you actually get into the tools that uh, were used uh, a very long time ago, and you cover that in uh, Psychoacoustics, which is chapter two of the book, which is um, peppered with some incredibly beautiful pictures of these whistles that were used to entrain the brain and the heart uh, in, in the ancient times. Uh, first, can you go into what you actually mean by the word psychoacoustic? Yeah, that's a word that's been really used in scientific circles to identify acoustic frequencies that affect brainwave patterns of human beings um, when they're exposed to them. So um, certainly the brain that's entrained by video games, um, and, and entrainment's another word that's kind of specific to this science, and that has to do um, with how the human, the human nervous system is almost looking to connect. It's almost like, you know, we, have, we walk around with wireless cell phones that are looking to connect to a wireless tower and give us service, and it's almost like our bodies, our whole immune systems are working to wirelessly connect to each other as well, telepathically and biorhythmically. And so this uh, tendency has been called the frequency following response, but 
Um, entrainment is a word that describes how the human body really um, correlates itself with others around and with any sound source, really. Entrainment frequencies on the beta-alpha border have been shown to facilitate sensory integration capable of leading human consciousness into a state of synesthesia, a complete integration of the senses. The synesthetic state is one of joined sensation, an involuntary experience of the co-mingling of images, sounds, smells, and tastes. A synesthete may describe music whose sounds look like shards of crystal, an eddy of multicolored triangles flowing in the visual field, or seeing the color red accompanied by the scent of red. Synesthesia appears to be an inherited trait associated with the X chromosome, as the female to male ratio is 5 to 1 among synesthetes and tends to occur in families, sometimes skipping a generation. One of the predominant effects of this type of joined perception is extremely heightened acuity of memory, perhaps attributable to the vividness of the joined sensory experiences themselves. Application um, of sound waves to enhance consciousness states and synchronize groups together into um, biorhythmic um, uh, oneness, basically. So, so that's a complex term, but I think that really it underlies so much of what's going on, not only in the ancient temples worldwide, but also in the effect of modern technologies, which are so um, toxic for us in acoustic effect as well. Absolutely. So we could say that um, the human mind or the human brain is going to be entrained to something probably 24-7. It's going to be seeking that out. Um, so the question is whether we're entraining ourselves into cell towers and, as you say, video games and things like that, or if we're kind of uh, putting our mind into connection with the more natural infrasounds and natural frequencies of the earth and of the cosmos uh, themselves. And there's a great quote here you have in the uh, beginning of psychoacoustics that I'd like to read, a very short one here. It says, the ancient sacred science of co consciousness is one of synchronized acoustic resonance with our mother earth, la Pachamama, which is, that's such a beautiful statement. And that kind of mm -hmm. sums up, I think, what you're trying to get at here in, in this in this chapter. Um, how yeah, did you come? Is. Oh, please go ahead. It is. Uh, it's such a. It's such an underwriting um, effect of consciousness that I think is overlooked, where we we don't identify the Mother Earth as being um, the unifying factor between all human existence. You know, other beings on this planet are connected through a field that's invisible and because we're, our consciousness is so limited to physical concepts and physicality and that we're so trained by them by the environment that I think that people are um, are empowered by understanding the invisible forces that connect us all and certainly the earth as an entity and understanding the earth as something that can be directly communicated with is I think one of the most important concepts and what I try to, you know, stir up with that, with that statement. Yes. Um, I don't want to get off track again, but um, after going barefoot for now, it's been over about eight months of going out actually into the mountains here in Japan, barefoot for, you know, hours on end every day. The experiential changes that take place are so tangible, they're so palpable that uh, um, there's just no way you can d deny them. You start to see things in a different way. You start to, uh, possibilities start opening up in your own being that, uh, at least in my case, I wasn't even aware of. You know, say mm -hmm. nine months ago. So this is a, it's a powerful science to to implement. And if uh, this work with psychoacoustics is anything close to going barefoot, then it's something I'm very interested in getting into. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us how you actually came across? Uh, well, you came across the psychoacoustic whistles through um, Klaus Dona, but uh, could you tell us how these were actually used? Um, if you look at the pictures of them, there's, you know, and obviously an opening where you blow into. Are you blowing into directly into the opening? Or are you kind of blowing across them like you do with we used to do when we were kids with a 
Coke bottles and things like that? And um, what, what's actually in, inside? Is that water or, or what's in there? Well, there are several different designs that have been used successfully over the years by, you know, many cultures. Um, and actually what these, my own discovery of psychoacoustic stone whistles in Chile was what actually led me to work with Klaus Dona and his exhibition. I was traveling for a, a year in um, Chile and Peru doing uh, fellowship studies from Brandeis University on um, basically artistic studies concerning the mummies found in the Atacama Desert. And that was a year-long study that really introduced me to so much of what fills my book um, with images and photographs that I took myself and especially of the artifacts. Uh, the first chapter really goes into um, my findings that I submit of stone whistles that I submitted with the acoustic studies to Klaus Dona for his exhibition. So having been led to my own, through my own investigations in the desert to find these whistles, I really needed to pour over the history of subsequent cultures that used uh, ceramics to produce the same effect that I was finding in the stone whistles on the coast of the Atacama Desert. Um, so I ended up being blown away by immediate discoveries through online investigations looking at papers uh, produced by UCLA researcher Daniel Statnikov, who basically um, characterized did a survey of, of ceramic whistling vessels from South American countries, and particularly Andean countries, and did a frequency studies recording the, the output to be able to compare and look for um, patterns. And he was able to unequivocally show that the each uh, particular culture had their own respective frequency and that those cultures were using bi-frequency whistles that had a uh, an interference frequency that was creating a third low frequency that was in the range of the human heartbeat and would bring the 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 mind resonance or the the rhythms of the mind down to resonance with the rhythms of the heart and so that connection really opened up my investigation into the pyramids because of the understanding of the heart way the heartbeat as uh, having a wavelength that could be resonated in a building. But that original concept comes from the bi-frequency whistles of the Andean cultures. Okay. Now, I really want so to get I, a grasp on that, that, um, that concept of binaural um, frequencies. Do you have what? The two frequencies are slightly different in, in their, uh, their yeah. speed, I would guess you would say. Huh? And then there's going to be a place where they line up. And that's where the, the yeah. third... Uh, uh, frequency is created, the third sound is created. Now, is that an inaudible sound, or is that something you'd actually yeah. be able to pick up with with, uh, with your ears? You can hear it with your ears, but only as an interesting sensation because it's a beat frequency or a beating in your eardrum. So it's almost as if there are two drum beats going on, and every now and then they both strike the same uh, at the same time, and all of a sudden you have a more intense sound. So it's it's kind of like a Oh, as it well, it's described in in ancient Andean symbolism by the hummingbird's wings. So it gives this effect of this flapping bird next next to your ear, which is something that Daniel Statnikov, in his study of the symbolism of these vessels, was able to show was associated with the frequency of the wing beats of the hummingbird itself, which matched the frequencies in the vessels at times. And so that third. Uh frequency or that third sound is what you refer to as the inner wind is that, is that correct that could be a definitely that met, that could be a good metaphor for this for this concept um i think too i can go into i didn't really fully answer your your question as far as to how the vessels work with right. water the um the two frequencies are produced in a second chamber of a two-chambered vessel. And the first chamber is has a simple tube connected to that's blown into and not across by the user. So you, you basically blow into it as you would, um, you know, a straw. And the two chambers are designed that they're connected below a water level that's maintained where 
Bubbles are forced by pressure from the first chamber through and below the water level into the secondary chamber, whereby equalizing the pressure so that you can take short breaths as you blow into the first tube, and yet you will have a continuous equalized pressure output of air which goes through the whistles in the second chamber, of which there are two to produce those two mixing frequencies. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, is the actual output, I don't see an output uh, opening on, on any of these. Uh, where does the, the sound actually come out? They're generally hidden. They're small, single holes that let out air, and there's a whistle built within the, the vessel itself, within the forms of a bird head or some appendage um, that actually has a whistle that is stimulated and the air exits that, you know, through that small opening. So some vessels are actually known to have three and it's hard to, just by looking at it, it's, you know, they're all closed vessels. So some of them have two chambers and some of them don't. And they're simpler vessels and you can't tell from the exterior. But usually playing it gives you a pretty, you know, recording the frequencies and analyzing it, you can get a good idea of what the interior structure must be um, allowing. Very interesting. Now, were these done in, uh, is this like a solo Act is this something that the, the, the practitioner himself is doing for himself, or were these in, uh, envisioned into like group uh, sessions, or you know the whole community in, in a sense? Well, actually, that's a that's a question that unequivocally can be answered. That this probably would never have been used alone, or if it was, it would have immediately called people to join in. And I, you know, certainly there were diverse cultures doing the same technique because these vessels were found throughout all of the ceramic cultures of the Andes, which, you know, extends that history extends throughout all regions continuously for many thousands of years. So the number of artifacts really shows that they were used in mass groups. And I think, too, the answer um, to how they may have been used in their temples may revolve around the presence of trapezoidal niches that are found in the stonework of all the Andean temples where these were found and used. Mm -hmm. So the actual uh, interior of the, of the pyramids themselves were probably used as uh, the location for, for, for playing these instruments then? Definitely. And the, the crystals and the stones were acting as energy storage and focusing for all that acoustic... Um, all those acoustic waves being generated by the instruments. And everyone, uh, one of the amazing uh, discoveries that I was mentioning from Daniel Satnikov was that he was able from his survey to determine that every culture had a distinct frequency. And so there was no individual acoustic identity. Everyone shared the same frequency. So it didn't have a use without a group application. It really shows a preoccupation with synchronizing um, uh, biorhythms, both within the body, within the two hemispheres of the brain, balancing that rhythmically, but also balancing the heart-mind rhythmically within a person, and as well the heart-to-heart -heart between two people. And so this effect could happen in a culture at all of their temples because the same frequency was being used, and of course the temples would have been strategically placed at resonant distances within the pyramid network itself to receive frequencies that were much lower and inaudible that were also stimulated by these vessels because of their beat frequency. So there's a whole integrated system working within the pyramids and sacred sites like Machu Picchu and pyramids like in Peru, Caral. There are many, many temples um, throughout the Andes that these um, designs all share the common feature of having niches that were recessed into walls that were not rectangular but almost looked like trapezoidal seeming like windows perhaps a niche of a foot deep or a foot and a half deep and these were closed windows there was no opening generally and so the idea has been that mummies were found in there, so offerings, these were like altars built into the wall. But of course, we found too that in pyramids, bodies don't desiccate. All studies have shown that in the pyramids, a body would naturally mummify and be preserved inside the pyramids without desiccation. So that effect, I think, also shows why mummies would have been placed in these niches and why they would have been preserved in the way they have. 
So there's a system for preservation of the body as well as augmentation of the, con uh, the consciousness of people who were playing these vessels within those, leaning into those niches and, you know, blowing into them using the, the, the effect of water so that they didn't have to understand and, and know circular breathing as you would if you played a didgeridoo. So you're saying like the preservation of a body, uh, that would be more of a, a secondary uh, aim of the, of the pyramids and the primary aim would be more um, kind of like imprinting a single identity onto the, onto the group or the uh, community that lives near that, that certain pyramid. Is that, is that a correct way of uh, interpreting yeah. that? Yeah, definitely. And I think, too, the, the effect would have been something that aligns not only, be, not only individuals who are playing these instruments, but, of course, you know, fetal um, uh, entrainment and the, the connection psychoacoustically or biorhythmically between the fetus and the mother during gestation is something that they, you know, playing these instruments would have augmented that as well. So I think it was really holistically used throughout the culture. And the younger the consciousness that was being developed within these conditions, the more potent the effect would be. And I think that um, there's direct, um, uh, invest direct evidence that this has really amazing benefits for the brain because neurogenesis is what's been studied where the thickness of the outer layers of the brain and certain parts of the brain um, in subjects of people, people who meditate often have been shown to be the result of neurogenesis happening because of biorhythmic synchronization within the meditators. And that activity generates uh, brain growth. So this in ancient, in ancient times would have been the result of these pyramids as well. And the acoustic vessels that we see everywhere would be analogous to super, super learning tools, essentially. And we have now, of course, people buying CDs that have acoustic entrainment techniques and audio recordings and all that. And, of course, they're cutting out entirely the other concepts that we have so integrated into the ancient techniques where they were using huge, colossal, monumental constructions built out of stone to resonate these vessels that they were all playing tuned to exactly the same frequency for the whole culture. Yeah, so it's amazing to, to kind of get a conception in your mind there, an image of what it must have been like in the pre-dynastic uh, Sanskrit culture there, of how you would have a whole group, uh, probably on a global scale, on a planetary scale, that were entrained to one frequency, and then each individual group around their respective uh, pyramid would be uh, entrained to their own group identity. And you see how in modern times we have uh, we have you know rock concerts held in domes, dome-shaped uh, stadiums, and things that are putting out a totally different type of a uh, mental entrainment, which is uh, something that hopefully will be going the way of the. Uh, by the, the by side here pretty soon. Um, I have worked with uh, Holosync for the past four years, which is similar to this kind of, an, of a concept of binaural audio uh, signals coming into the left ear and the right ear, both a little bit um, different in frequency, and that creates this uh, third frequency or the, the inner wind there. And I found it to be very effective, but the effect, tend, in my case, tended to uh, kind of die off after a couple of years. And I, now I only use it to uh, kind of put myself to sleep at night when I'm having trouble sleeping. But mm -hmm. uh, let's get back to um, the instruments themselves, the, the whistles themselves. Do you believe they were used in conjunction with, uh, for example, uh, entheogens or uh, things like ayahuasca or other aids, you could say? I bet they were, but I kind of imagine that those things were strong medicine for, um, you know, health or, you know, psychological situations, spirit possessions, the most extreme cases, um, and that most of the spiritual technologies of the ancient peoples revolved around using acoustics and more subtle techniques. And certainly artifacts I present in my book, Phi, show the connections between acupressure and acupuncture 
in throughout the world in ancient times, and specifically in a set of artifacts from Suta Tausa, Colombia, which uh, display very, very tiny acupuncture tools which are made out of stone. They're, they're literally needles of stone. So there are certainly ancient technologies that range far, far deeper into the past, and they're connected with Asia in a way that um, we don't really describe to the technologies used in the Amazon as far as ayahuasqueros or um, the use of entheogens. But I'd say that one of the biggest connections which I really um, was, was intrigued by came through research by Jacob Davidovitz, who was studying uh, stone monuments and the residues of oxalic acid that were discovered. Um, and in his investigations, he realized that oxalic acid could be used to disaggregate stone and might um, reveal the presence of ancient techniques for synthetic um, uh, casting of concrete like stones. And so he ended up going into the Amazon and, and was able to discern Amazonian techniques where oxalic acid was used from rhubarb leaves and concentrated with an admixtures to dissolve stones. And so that dissolution process or disassociation of stone was chemically done and is still practiced today in the Amazon by cultures who use entheogens. So there are certainly very strong direct links to show that uh, rhubarb and so many plants had found ancient uses for some things that we would like to attribute slave labor to when in fact they were using chemicals and advanced techniques of stone casting that didn't involve um, you know, slave labor, but may have involved in fact levitating stones as well as pouring them. So I think there's so much more that can be understood if we really dig in to look at the science of what the stones tell us themselves. And I think the stones have uh, many of the mysteries for us. That is very interesting. So they're actually using the plant uh, chemistry to break down the stones and then I would assume then recombining them into the, the, the block shape that they want to use in the actual construction of the pyramids. Yeah, it's a thermosetting process. So they disaggregate the stone into a slurry and then cast it and set it through heat, heat processes. So I think that explains exactly what was done as well at the Giza pyramids where it's been shown by Davidovitz through all kinds of different examinations that the stone is, has to be synthetic because of the density, the content of micro bubbles and all other factors, including organic material that was mixed in with the stone when it was cast and showing that it must have been synthetically um, manufactured rather than naturally sedimented and then quarried. Right, you mentioned that there's even human hairs found within the, uh, within the stones. Definitely, and I think the, the DNA studies as well as the age, you know, testing, the radiocarbon testing of those hairs could reveal marvelous things that we'll have to wait before, you know, the authorities will release that information or let it be uh, known, let it be known within their circles and without. So those, those times, you know, the truth is it's all there is, so science is uh, an expanding field that is really just a question of time when those things will become more publicly known, although it's Davidovitz's work was in the 80s, so this is nothing new. And they must uh, be aware of th this research, you know, um, the Egyptologists and uh, the people who are controlling the information in, in other areas of the world, they must be aware of the, his research, so they're, that, that would indicate that there is a... Uh, intentional and concerted effort to keep this out of the public awareness and out of the scientific community as well. Huh? Certainly, and I think people like uh, Robert Schock, who produced research about the uh, vertical rain weathering of the Sphinx, really embarrassed the Egyptian authorities and their obvious occlusion of, of important facts. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's something that really we need to step beyond and release that information and, and spread it uh, throughout, you know, throughout the media, such that it's it's pointless um, to argue otherwise because it's common knowledge, and that's just the pace of information dissemination, which is increasing all the time. Yes, yes. There's a, a growing number of people that are very interested in, in finding out the truth about the pyramids and about uh, 
the, the ancient cultures. And yeah, if they could uh, do more analysis of, of the uh, stones themselves, that would give us a uh, time frame of when they were created, which would obviously lead to when the pyramids themselves were created and the technologies behind it. That would just totally change the whole concept we have about these ancient structures. And I think, too, their connection with structures like Stonehenge, which are accepted to have been erected by uh, Celtic or, you know, Anglo-Saxons. And yet, when we look at the genetic makeup of the pharaonic line in Egypt, we also find that these are Anglo-Saxon or Western European genetic line. So I think that that in itself, the genetic information in the mummies as well as in the stones are really contradicting what has been accepted uh, in, in Egyptology circles for many years. Yes, you have many of the uh, pharaohs with red hair and uh, genetic material that uh, would indicate they came from, uh, well, like Michael Sarian talks about coming from, uh, from Ireland. Yeah, and I think too that the effect of the pyramids on genetic material too is part of why it was so important for the Egyptians to preserve those mummies. It was part of the whole thing was that these pyramids and this lifestyle that these uh, pharaohs were living inside them were changing the very makeup of their DNA and that was in the mummification process was consciously preserving that uh, changes, those alterations that had been achieved as a you know, because of the pride that this culture was taking in their ability to produce these advanced consciousness or, um, you know, more genetically developed beings. And that would come more in the, uh, kind of in the later stages of things, because you're talking about how more in the, in the Sanskrit culture, when it was flourishing on the planet, that was more, probably more, I don't want to use the word democratic, but it was more widespread throughout the population. So maybe this was um, these efforts to preserve a pharaonic line or a king's um, lineage was something that came across, uh, came about later. Huh? I think so, and I think we have to look at the writings of the cuneiform tablets from Sumer in that light, because I think authors like Zechariah Sitchin, who passed away recently have offered such a wonderful, uh, clear translation of those texts, and yet the interpretations need to be, I think, understood through that lens of, of realizing that there was a separation being man, uh, maintained by the um, pharaohs and the kings of old who benefited from those energies in those pyramids. So that that kind of dichotomy between um, the pharaoh, you know, that's really the first class separation, I believe, in the way the pyramids were used, and that prior to that, there was a more holistic use, which is reflected in the tradition of the Maya culture in Mexico. There's no, uh, their whole process involved initiation of all, in all beings for enlightenment, all, all beings seeking enlightenment at the pyramids. And I think that certainly stands closer to the root of the tree and the Egyptian tradition and the more uh, elite traditions that we might see in other parts of the world, as in Sumer, are uh, need to be understood as, their writings need to be understood as propaganda of that time, you know. Yeah, so when I look, yeah. at, I look at something like a concept like Nibiru, in my work I present the presence of a binary twin of our sun, which is described as an embryo sun or a um, in science, uh, astronomical terms, a uh, brown dwarf that is now dormant, and so it creeps up on our solar system in a long elliptical orbit that's unseen. And that concept, I believe, directly corresponds to things that we have in ancient writings and may correspond to that concept of Nibiru as well, which may not be an inhabited planet as we're told in the Sumerian text. <laughs> well, that's a whole nother big con uh, concept and line of thought to get into. Let's um, save that for a later time because uh, I want to give justice more to um, your psychoacoustic chapter here. So if that's all right with you, let's skip back there a little bit to um, the connection of the instruments themselves with, with animal figures. You, you list uh, cats, bats, hummingbirds, snakes, and then of course, you know, wings. Uh, that are all mm -hmm. associated with a sound and like the purring of a cat. 
and then the actual wave structures, the wave forms that are written onto the um, whistles themselves. What is your uh, take on that? How do you how do you view the, the whistles from that to point of view? The actual figures that are written onto them. Yeah, that's a that's definitely I think part of the way uh, ancient cultures were encoding the information that they of the of the science of consciousness by using symbols that are found in nature that are ever present. So a lot of the references that might be used in the holosync material that you're reading may not be understood by people thousands of years from now, whereas the the purr of a cat will have the same healing of effect on a person thousands of years from now that it does for us today. And that's exactly why these vessels were using that symbolism to really transcend any kind of uh, um, abstract concept and bring these right in, use nature to explain exactly uh, the root of the uh, natural science of consciousness that was being applied. So I think definitely the the all of the animals that are seen in these whistles we have bats which are associated with echolocation right the third eye third eye power we have dolphins as well in the lamana connection collection of artifacts there's a stone dolphin head which you know obviously has to do with the uh, acoustic ability a third eye ability of the dolphin to image without using the eyes mm -hmm. so that that third eye i think um, concept directly connects with the photosensitivity of the pineal gland because it is a receptor that um, works with regulating through the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, uh, regulating the different chemical balances from the body that are driven and need to correspond to circadian rhythms and the day cycle, day and night cycle. So that photoreceptivity of the pineal gland literally receives light through the crown chakra from the sun through your brain and that light is what allows your body to synchronize itself and i believe the um conditions that are created within the hemispheric um, resonance or the synchronization that these vessels create are the same ones that are naturally created for example by contact with elephants or the purring of cats as we said or hearing whale songs all of the bird songs, all of these things are uh, intrinsically healing for the human mind because nature is the resonance that's experienced between a human being living in nature is is designed. Is intelligent design is is a simplified concept of, but we see that everywhere around us, and it's undeniable yes. that the universe is trying to heal human beings, and in fact human beings in in straying from this energy we find all around us in nature has really harmed himself absolutely that is such an important concept to uh to get into your into your brain and into your outlook on life because we see that you know dolphin therapy there's a a man here in japan not far from where i live who was an olympic uh, coach in uh, uh horse uh horsemanship and he now runs a animal therapy uh, center for children who have trouble going to school, you know, who have mental problems or psychological problems. They will come to his uh, horse farm and, and uh, live with the horses for a year, groom them and ride them and take care of them. And well, almost without exception, these children are then able to go back to school about a year later. They've been healed just by contact with the horses. Mm -hmm. but it's, a, it's a very deep concept to, that we need to take on board i think that uh connection with nature and especially with animals uh can have a huge healing effect on on the human body and the human mind mm -hmm. and, and i think mm -hmm. through exclusively through synchronization as well which is um which is just profound to realize that you, the energy of another being's heart can fuel your heart if it's in synchronization you know that in itself means your heart has to beat less because it's surrounded by that energy of resonance. And so that itself, you know, is, is something, you know, how many times does your heart need to beat in your life and how much energy does it expend and how many more heartbeats can you allow yourself if you accept the energy from the, from the living things around you? You know, that's, that's really what my whole life has become an experiment in discovering. How long can I live if I do apply mm -hmm. what I now understand about nature and about my own body and about the pyramids? You know, 
yeah, a great time. Extending the the time span of your life and, and, and probably even on a more profound level in deepening your life. You're, you're in more in connection with Mother Earth and with uh, with the cosmos in a sense. And certainly the quality of the life directly reflects your connectivity. And I found that in my own experience, and I think everyone can relate to that, that really there is everything that's impermanent, and this is a, a concept that's a Buddhist concept, but certainly goes right back to the Sanskrit uh, traditions that built the pyramids, that attachments of the physical kind um, come and go. But what's permanent is the joy and the knowledge of the truth, which is, which is timeless. And those things, I think, are the things that once you reach for those fruits, you are given the ability to grow and, you know, the, the kind of outstretched hand that we're offered from nature is something that you have, you, you learn to accept and you thrive because of it. And if you don't, you're given another chance. You know, it's, it's an amazing, there's so many people who put pressure on the events of 2012 as if there's some way that we can fail. <laughs> I just right. don't really, I don't really see the possibility there <laughs> with the energies that were being offered. You know, it's quite remarkable to live at this time and to see what's happening. Yes, it's an overwhelming, unconditional love, like the, the, the metaphor that you give of, of the hand being extended to us. And if we don't take it up the first time, it'll be there a second time and a third time. Yeah, and it's really our own forgetfulness uh, of its existence that we're waking up from and. It's only the, you know a nightmare if you allow it to be, and I think you know at this time the level of consciousness on the planet is denying the nightmare that's being programmed by whatever media powers or you know these these mm-hmm. negative images that are portrayed everywhere around us really losing are losing effect you know rapidly because people are tuning into what's really happening. I, I agree. I think people are are, are waking up very rapidly because the the um, how would you say the uh, the weapons that they're kind of using that they're throwing at us. People are just seeing through them right and left. It's just it's not having effect it would, it would have had you know ten years ago or thirty years ago. So there's a yeah. vast uh, rapid awakening taking place. So this awakening definitely is finding its source in the changes that our entire solar system is going through and our sun particularly. And I think that as we watch and solar physicists are are watching what's unfolding, they realize that the 2001 solar mass um, maximum observed is going to be very much unlike the upcoming 2012 solar maximum of December 22nd, which will be a culmination, I think, on order of magnitude several times greater than anything um, that was emitted, you know, the solar mass ejections and everything that was produced by the sun in 2001 is an indicator, but uh, the scale of things we're going to witness in 2012, not only with the sun's activity, but with human consciousness, is going to be uh, remarkable, truly remarkable. What were some of the things we saw happen in, in 2001? Well, that was really the last... A uh, heightened period of activity where we saw uh, solar flares, like X-class solar flares going off all the time, a lot of M-class flares as well. And all of that energy that's transmitted from the sun in these huge ejections of plasma is arriving to Earth and really affecting human consciousness through the pyramids and the way the pyramids transduce those energies into infrasound waves that move through the stone in our planet's surface in the lithosphere. So really that um, that deep connection is going to be culminating. And I think everything that we see in terms of uh, the natural processes of Earth, um, weather systems and environmental systems, migration patterns, those are all exactly reflected as well in the consciousness of human beings where we find complete confusion reigning at times and patterns of human activity that have lasted for thousands of years or industrial activities that have lasted only hundreds of years are quite obviously showing their um, their lack of sustainability and are going to have to change and uh, forcefully so with the with the solar influence very interesting yes and we're coming up uh, to that uh, 
event in, in uh, almost exactly two years from now. So I think things are going to be quickening up the pace here in the next uh, year, year and a half. Um, so Alex, let's go ahead and take a little break here. And when we come back, we will go into the uh, final parts of your chapter on psychoacoustics. All right. Looking forward to it. Good. back with Grok the Talk, and we are continuing to talk about this fascinating subject of psychoacoustic instruments, these whistles um, that Alex has presented in his book, Phi. And let's go on to these very interesting characters here. I'm not even sure how to pronounce this. Is it the, the Chang-Kai? Uh, Chang-Kai, I Chang -Kai. believe. Chang-Kai, yeah. okay. This is a very interesting um, three-toned vessel of this... Uh, fellow with a very huge head and a very large torso and six fingers and he has um, waveforms coming out of his mouth into his ears. Um, what is the significance of this, uh, how would you say, the the format that this is, is put into? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting vessel right there. Um, I've looked and looked at that and spoken with several um, archaeologists who have been curating museums where these are displayed, and they're thought to be, I believe they're kind of analogous, these figures, to what are called the Wangina figures in um, Australian Aboriginal traditions. Wangina. So, Wangina, exactly. And so these, uh, these small, what in some circles have been called, and in my book I refer to them as oculate beings because there's this preoccupation with this hypnotic effect of their almond-shaped eyes. But in this uh, sculpture as well, we can see these very, you know, dark almond-shaped eyes that are penetrating in a way and almost in a childlike body, which is why it's so, such an enigmatic presence to these sculptures and indeed to a lot of the, the artwork around the world from ancient cultures that are obviously identifying some creature that is not human and yet does, is not easily defined in any of those cultures either. And of course, supernatural um, powers are ascribed to these beings and their association with human genetic, uh, potentially genetic manipulation or some other kind of activity on the earth um you know in in some in some way is is involved with these ancient teachings and we're learning more about that connection as we start to understand how the vedic traditions are connected with psychoacoustics and how trance and all of these uh, uh deeper methods of of accessing hypnotic um memories or accessing memories through hypnotic effect um, are turning up all kinds of amazing things in what's called today the abduction um, uh, field of research into alien extraterrestrial abduction. So I think these artifacts are so enigmatic and relate so directly to what we find in this field um, of modern paranormal activity that uh, it really beckons a lot of further study. And I, my new book addresses the extraterrestrial aspect of our reality 
and the connections between the pyramids and ancient sculptures like this one from the Chiang Kai. And that new book is called Light Water, which, as you mentioned at the opening of the interview, is uh, available now. So I hope people can get into the first chapter and learn more about some of the details that have been discovered about ancient artifacts associated with beings that appear as this uh, as this individual that's been sculpted by the Chiang Kai. So you actually go into that in uh, the first part of, of Lightwater. Yeah, the first chapter delves into the connection between the Roswell crash and certain texts that have been uh, uh, videotaped and photographed on uh, wreckage, supposedly from the Roswell incident, which I'm able to authenticate because of the fact that it is authentic Sanskrit text that could not have been forged certainly in 1947 when those artifacts were supposedly photographed, nor could they have been forged when those videos were released of those images in the 90s. So I think the, uh, the language itself is what ties these artifacts together with others that are found throughout Mexico and the Andes that really show that Sanskrit culture has and our ancient roots have uh, significant connections to and knowledge that bear, has great bearing on what's going on right now with so-called extraterrestrial experiences. So these, some of these figures, especially the, the one we're talking about now and then the, uh, the Dogu ones from Japan, they certainly do have a human but non-human aspect to them. Do you think that these were, um, let's say, the native humans' attempt to recreate what they had seen in, in, a, in a format, or are, were they more instructed to uh, create them in this, in this manner, if you know what well, I mean? I think, yeah, I think there was some of both going on, and certainly the most um, truthful cultural knowledge that was passed on surrounding these beings um, has to do with preserving, um, you know, the image, the actual physical appearance of these beings. But, you know, it's, it's such a complex topic, and I have, uh, in my new book, I have delved into it from so many, you know, particular angles that I think were successful in tying together certain facets of it. But as far as looking at this in the ancient cultural context that i think is um is it's really hard to make any progress there without understanding the physics of what ancient cultures were doing and the physics of what extraterrestrial technologies experienced today by people um are doing and how those are connected you know what the, how those technologies interface and the key of course is water and i think the mind and the Mayan pyramids and the water technologies and um, initiations that with sacred waters that are going on at those periods, at those pyramids, are also um, undertaken when extraterrestrial contacts um, are occurring. And so the, you know, extraterrestrials are literally um, bringing people into higher dimensional experience through the energized states of water that the pyramids also create. And so pyramids and UFOs are, or flying objects are really operating on the same physics as stealth technology. And there's a whole ball of wax to, uh, to unwrap there. But. Absolutely. I mean, God, it's, it's just, uh, we haven't even gotten through one chapter yet, and it, there's uh, uh, still multiple a uh, avenues we could explore within this chapter. So <laughs> going through your, your work, Going through your books is just an amazing uh, uh, adventure. Um, let's look at um, the next uh, pan pipes that you have here, which are uh, five in number, and they all encode different um, tonal systems. You've got a, a nine one, a ten tonal one, and they incorporate numbers that you th uh, highlight as three, five, and seven. Uh, can you talk about the significance of the three? The, the actual numbers of three, five, and seven, and their connection with the pan pipes. Yeah, that's a that's a very curious thing that keeps popping up in these um, artifacts from all over the world, and indeed in the pyramids themselves. We're looking at multiple frequencies producing these amazing effects of consciousness, and of course we have three pyramids, which would then produce three frequencies together. Mm -hmm. And in these artifacts and the whistles you're mentioning that are from 
uh, near Puma Punku in Bolivia, these um, also produce three frequencies, these pamphlets. But they're very interesting because unlike normal pan flutes that you might play today from bamboo reeds or things like that, the openings of these pan flutes are actually connected to one another laterally so that the exits for the wind blown across the pan, each pan flute are in the adjacent pipes. And that has an effect of creating resonance in those pipes as well. And there's also the hyperventilation effect when you play these because there's so much air that needs to fill those two adjacent pipes. So the effect of playing these is really profound, and it's most profound on the third, fifth, and seventh notes, which on every instrument are shown as special notes. Those, those pan pipes specifically are denoted by concentric circles or differentiated by a, a repeating pattern that shows them to be special. Yes, actually along the side of the pan pipes there are, in, at where the three and five and then the seven are, there's a, a circle that's highlighted, obviously trying to draw your attention to that. Huh? Yeah, and so in the sonogram that I've reproduced in my book, um, you can clearly see how those notes produce this uppermost harmonic and produces the strongest three-frequency uh, or tri-frequency resonance uh, when you play them. And so... I really believe that these were not instruments that were played in a way to reproduce music or um, specific songs, but in fact, and they could have been used that way, certainly, but in light of the fact that we have uh, thousands of years of ceramic traditions producing vessels that were on one fixed frequency or two fixed frequencies that would not um, be, uh, you know, that would that would be constant for all the instruments. In this case, again, we'd have to assume that the third, fifth, and and seventh notes were primarily used and in continuous long tones to produce effects in the brain, rather than to reproduce a melody. So, so. the three, uh, the three, five, and seven together then would create create that third. Um audible or inaudible sound that would affect the, the brain and the heart? Well, not those three separate ones together, but each one, if you play the third or the fifth or the seventh, mm -hmm. will resonate with that highest harmonic. Oh, okay, okay. So it's not in combination. They're, they'd be used yeah. in, in kind of a melody, you could say. Yeah, each one separately will produce those three, three tones. Okay. And my own experience when I played it, um, not only when I was you know, reproducing this, uh, well, producing the sounds for this sonogram, but just, you know, in the 10 or 15 minutes trying to, um, you know, familiarize with myself with it to be able to produce the tones and practice, I was really taken by sensations I was having in my face and my body that were what everyone describes as Kundalini experiences. And amazingly enough, one of the pan flutes from this collection shows an infant with bare feet that has lines of energy moving up into the feet yeah. and then out the hands. And that, obviously, the infant would not have the ability of the embouchure to be able to play an instrument like this, especially because it needed such a high um, air pressure to produce sound. So, of course, the other conclusion is that these whistles were used for fetal or infant consciousness development, and the effects and the energies moving through the infant uh, show the barefoot lifestyle and the energy water and all the other things that we're talking about that we can ascribe to this ancient pyramid culture. That's very interesting. So if you saw this pipe without the, the background information that you've provided, you would just think, oh, it's a cute little pipe with a, with, a, they, with a little baby there. But when you look into it, it's, they're saying very directly the effects that it has on, on an infant. And I find it very interesting that it's actually a smoking pipe as well. Which yeah, one of the collection is a smoking pipe. And on that pipe, it shows an infant holding pan flutes. So that's, again, uh, obviously the pipe was used for adults for smoking, and yet all of these were sacred instruments for that that were intimately associated with these entrainment technologies for for you know development of consciousness from the very you know young even in the womb. So the, the pipe you have uh, depicted here in the book is that the actual pipe that you yourself uh, 
used to, to, to recreate these sounds? Yeah, I was able to record frequencies from most of the pan pipes. Um, some of the chambers, some of the actual pan pipes are broken, the stone, right, right. and they, you know, no tones can be achieved. But for all of the, you know, complete pan pipes, I was able to record a tone and then line them up and edit them into what we see as a sonogram here. At this point, I would like to introduce Alex's audio files of him actually playing these uh, various pan pipes that he has so graciously um, offered the audio files for. So in order, we have first up a whistle from his stone collection from the Chinchoro culture, followed by a Bolivian seven-tone pan flute. Following that is an Andean whistling jar, which comes from the later Chancay civilization. And the final track is of a ceramic vessel that is being played without being blown through. It's actually just the water moving from one chamber to another chamber by uh, merely tilting the instrument. So please enjoy these, and you might want to uh, loop them and put them on your listening device and see how they affect your consciousness. Unsolved Mysteries exhibition, and unfortunately, the exhibition was never able to make use of my information, my discoveries, or my sound recordings, and the artifacts were never, and the whistles have never been publicly played. So that's unfortunate, but something I hope in the future to be able to uh, remedy and be able to produce that, not only those beautiful sounds, but reproduce the effect that I felt in my body, which was so profound. How long did the effects of that last? Was did they continue on in, in your uh, in your psyche for for some time, or did this go away at, uh, 
uh, shortly after you stopped playing? Well, I'd say the only thing that continued on really was just my amazement with what had happened. You know, it was it was definitely a brief effect, and it wore off, I would say, you know, within 20 minutes or just kind of like any meditation experience. You know, when you come out of a meditation, you certainly are have been experiencing altered consciousness, and it takes you time to, um, you know, rehabilitate or step back into that part of your mind that deals with conscious reality. But, you know, certainly the effects were so intense that it, it left me, left my whole body quivering, you know, my stomach feeling butterflies a little bit, my whole um, chest and abdomen feeling kind of like jittery and even the muscles in my mouth and my chin feeling like um, just uncontrollable twitching kind of nothing, nothing repetitive, but just, just a kind of um, just so energized, you know, that feeling like you just ran a marathon and you're just pulsing your blood is just moving it was very invigorating wow wow that's very very interesting do you, do you think these could be recreated by just a, a layman do you, if you had the instructions the uh, the layout of one of these pipes could they be recreated do you think well that's my goal and i have discovered that it's not as easy as it looks number one the tunings are so key that you need to you need to make direct molds of these instruments and use you know actual casts from those to recreate it. But I have made great progress in learning the technique that this blackware ceramic was produced, and I should be able to replicate the quality of the ceramic by using Davidovitz technologies where he was able to add um, lye and soda ash into the clay as powder, and thereby just using a normal fire could achieve stoneware quality and a blackware finish. I think that's exactly what these Bolivian artifacts and pamphlets um, show in their, um, you know, con their construction. And as well, that would probably be what was the case for the Etruscan artifacts, which is what Davidovitz points out in his studies. The Etruscan being um, in, in Italy, that area of the world. Right, right. Oh, it would be wonderful if you could uh, get that kind of information and that kind of technology out. Uh before we go through the 2012 uh, mega event, because um, to me this is a very, very important thing to uh, entra start entraining our own um, our own brain and in our heart and our uh, pineal gland in that way. Uh, it would be wonderful if you can uh, step that up. Do you, do you see that coming out uh, in the next, uh, say, year or so? So as far as putting together a museum to be able to uh, share this information with the public, that's certainly a goal that's going to happen in the near future. And when we get that accomplished, certainly a major component will be giving people the experience of these sounds, playing them themselves, handling replicas of the artifacts that allow them to really get to know this on a physical level, not just on an intellectual level. So certainly this I'm hoping can happen in not only Ecuador and Lamana, where I'm um, working right now, but also in the Yucatan. Hopefully, we can have another location and possibly elsewhere in the world. So, I think if interest bubbles, we can certainly um, share these ideas wherever possible. Well, that is very exciting, and I think interest will be bubbling. Um, I believe I bit off a bit more than I could chew today. I was hoping we'd get in through uh, chapters two and three, and we've just barely made it through chapter two because there's just the, the uh, depth of the information is so incredible. But I hope to continue on with um, the other chapters in FI in future interviews with, with Alexander. And I do want to mention one other thing that you had posted on your contact part of your website where you say you are creating a conduit for these ancient teachings to enhance our blossoming awareness. Researcher J.C. McFadden is developing a forum for group discussions to be held in our sacred circle in Oakland, California. Is there a way that people who are not in the area around Oakland, California could um, participate in what you are doing here? Well, definitely, and I think we need a place. That's the whole 
um, crux of the work right now is to find a place where we can invite people and share this information in a more holistic environment because certainly Oakland, California is not a, a very sacred place or certainly has not been maintained in that sanctity. Um, so that's why we're working towards a uh, spot in Ecuador and certainly we want to invite people. I get emails from so many wonderful people who I'd love to be able to meet in person and uh, I'm looking forward to doing that and it's on the top of my list and having my new book um, published really allows me and frees me up to pursue those things and hopefully be able to connect with so many more people that are interested in this way of life because really I want to lead by example and living it and talking about these things and living in a city is not something that I really want to continue much longer. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating and I hope we can do some uh, future interviews and continue this as a series and hopefully work up into your latest book, Lightwater, as well. I would love to do that. Thanks so much for having me and we'll do it again soon. Okay. Thank you, Alex, and I will talk to you later. All right. See you.